And I wouldn't have sort of designed this life because those losses led me here. And I don't say that in a like, so it was all worth it. It's just sort of my perspective has been coming to terms with like, just looking at how those dots connected, feeling compassion for them and knowing that this is different than what I thought. It's not better. It's not worse. It's not maybe what I've hoped for, but I, I also can feel love and, and joy in this moment. And I think for me too, a, a big part of that learning and acceptance was, oh, the grief won't go away, um, but other things will be introduced. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Seek the Joy podcast. Happy Seek the Joy Tuesday. I'm your host, Sydney Weiss, and today on the podcast, we are diving into a topic that I don't think we've talked much about yet on Seek the Joy in almost four years. We're talking about grief and loss, but really beyond that, why we can't have grief and loss without joy and love. And apologies in advance for the background noise on this intro. I just finished moving into my new apartment and I'm figuring out the acoustics as we speak. So bear with me. This conversation could not be more powerful. And just as I'm even beginning to talk to you about what this conversation is, I have like full body goosebumps. I'm joined for this conversation by Krista Couture. She's an award-winning performing and recording artist, nonfiction writer, and broadcaster. She is also proudly indigenous, mixed Cree and Scandinavian, queer, disabled, and a mom. And over the course of Krista's acclaimed career, she's become known unenviably as an expert in loss, singing, speaking, and writing about the childhood cancer that led to the amputation of her left leg, abortion, and the tragic deaths of her two infant sons. And this conversation for me was probably the first time I've spoken openly with someone on the podcast a little bit about loss in my life. It's an incredibly heartfelt conversation. It's probably one of my favorites to date. And what's so interesting is that Krista has really come to know every corner of grief, yet through it all, she has found connection, joy, and the ability to feel and honor her experiences through it. And as I have been looking for models in a way of how to process my grief, when I came across Krista and her story, I just was like, oh my God, we have to have a conversation for the podcast. So we dive into so much in this conversation from Krista's grief bio and how grief has transformed her, why we need to create from the scar and not the wound. And if anybody out there knows who coined that phrase first, please tell me and Krista because it is so powerful. We talk about how we can take care of ourselves when expressing and sharing our grief. And we dive into her book, How to Lose Everything, why she sees the book as an opportunity to really give back and advice for anyone who wants to support those in their life who are experiencing grief and loss. We also talk about the shift in perspective that comes with loss, letting go of this idea that things will get better and instead accepting that things are just going to be different. And then we talk about why resilience sucks and why it's okay to not be resilient. We go into boundaries around grief, why grief really doesn't exist in isolation. Plus, Krista shares her experience shifting to a very beautiful and visible prosthetic leg and no longer hiding her disability, her biggest dream, and honestly, so much more. One of the reasons why I do this podcast is because I really want you to be able to live a happier, more joyful, and just ease-filled life. And so that's why I'm so happy to share that today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. The last year and a half, there is no doubt it's been difficult. And that's why I think now more than ever, it's important that we have reliable resources that we can turn to. And that's where BetterHelp comes in. So this is how it works. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. It's easy and free to change counselors if you don't think the person you're matched with is a good fit. And this service is available for people worldwide too. 
BetterHelp also offers a broad range of expertise in their counselor network, so you'll get timely and thoughtful responses, and you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions too. So as a listener of Seek the Joy podcast, you will get 10% off your first month by going to betterhelp.com slash seek the joy. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash seek the joy. The link will also be included in our show notes. Through Chris's life experiences from the loss of her leg due to childhood cancer, the tragic death of her infant son, the loss of her second son combined with her divorce, Krista has really become an expert in loss. And I have found, and I'm so interested to hear if this has been your experience, there's an incredible gift that comes from sharing our experience with grief. And when we allow ourselves to express our emotions, it opens the door for greater connection, understanding, hope, and joy. So I cannot wait to hear what you think about this one. Make sure to join the conversation on our social media channels, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. We are at Seek the Joy Podcast everywhere. Hit follow wherever it is that you're listening to podcasts. And Krista, thank you so much again for this really powerful conversation. You can find the links to How to Lose Everything and all of Krista's beautiful music in the show notes for today's episode. And without further ado, let's dive into this one why we really can't have grief and loss without joy and love with Krista Couture. Thank you for, for coming on the podcast. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. You have really, I think, come to know every corner of grief through your life experiences and what you've documented both through your music, but also your memoir, How to Lose Everything. So I want to start off with this question. What was it like moving from only really writing music? And I know that you've done other writing before, but then transitioning into writing a book and a memoir, I just imagine like this is a totally different experience. So so what was that like for you? Yeah, it's really different. And mm-hmm. I hadn't, it's not like I hadn't planned to write a memoir, I, <laughs> but it's sort of dots connected that led me to it because I didn't think of myself as a writer. I mean, other writers around me have been like, but songwriting is writing. It's okay. It is writing. Can, it's writing. You can yes. call yourself a writer. Yes. And I was, you know, blogging. And I think I just had some hangups on like what makes a writer, right? Like very mm-hmm. unfair things that I would only apply to myself, that kind of mm-hmm. uh, situation. And, um, and, but I'd been invited to write an essay, um, uh, because I was blogging, pause. I'm going to try this again. <laughs> okay, this got it. It was like about to veer in another direction. I'm going to cut that part out. <laughs> um, the biggest difference between songwriting and and writing uh, this memoir has been how it kind of comes to me. Like mm. as a songwriter, songs have always felt like these gifts that arrive and I Mm -hmm. do my best to accept them and then you know share them with the world and they come songs come in these just real moments of of inspiration and it's something I've never wanted to analyze too much because I feel like if you question the muse she might get scared and run away or something yeah wow yes it's always been something that felt like moved through me and um, I'm very grateful that that songs come that way. And that's not to say I don't craft them and I don't practice and stuff, but in that moment of creation there, they feel like they're coming from another place and I'm receiving them. The writing of the book was very, very like intentional. Like I had Mm -hmm. to sit down and write the book. And there were still moments of being, you know, kind of what you might call in the flow or hitting those blocks or I wasn't sure what to do. I found there was much more kind of puzzling with the book of like connecting dots. Does this make sense? This doesn't make sense. I need to fill in something here. And so it was a more kind of intellectual task, still very creative. And I loved that puzzling. I loved piecing it Mm -hmm. together, but it was such a like, sit down, get it done. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's so interesting what you just shared. The difference between songwriting is this beautiful gift that you said that shows up in the moment. And then writing the book was very intentional. And I think we can sort of get hung up on how we allow ourselves to define or express our creativity. Like if it doesn't look like the way we're accustomed to, then it's not creative. Or if it doesn't allow me to show up in the way I'm accustomed to, then I'm not supposed to do it. 
it's like, hello, like you're creative, express it in any way that allows you to, it doesn't have to fit like a certain box. Yeah. And I, I had to kind of come to that conclusion myself as well mm -hmm. through this because it was happening in a different way that I was like, is this as artful? Yes. <laughs> um, does this still count? You know? Mm -hmm. um, and there were still moments where like an idea would spark, you know, I'd be washing the dishes and I think, oh, that's what it is. Or this is the story or that's going to be the entry point. So I, I was able to kind of see, oh, this is just, this is a different mode and there's a different experience when it comes to creating. And I'm, I'm really glad that I discovered that for myself because of mm. course there's no right, wrong way to create. It doesn't have to look a certain way. Um, yeah, so that was really true. Mm. Through sharing your music and also writing this book, you mentioned the book was a very intentional practice for you. How do you take care of yourself in those moments? Because you're, you're talking about grief, you're writing about your own personal experiences. I would imagine it brings up a lot of emotion, a lot of intensity. How, how have you been able to take care of yourself or what was even that journey like for you while writing the book? Mm -hmm. There were times where I'd be you know, going into a certain story or know that, okay, this story, I'm, I'm getting ready to write this scene. There was things that I would do in advance because I, you know, could anticipate that this was going to be difficult. And first of all, I had a very clear plan. I kind mm -hmm. of connect to this intentional writing of the book. I'd, you know, written an outline. I'd already decided what I would mostly include and certainly what I would not include. Mm -hmm. So I knew the places I wouldn't go that would be too much for me as a writer, maybe too much for a reader. Um, but still there's these, you know, very vulnerable, very painful moments in the book. And so beforehand I would, um, uh, I'm, I'm Cree, I have sweet grass, you know, in the corner, I would just, you know, kind of smudge and do, like, take a moment to ground myself um, and then go into the writing. And if it felt like the emotion while I was writing was becoming more than I could contain in, in, the, in the book, I would, you know, just stop, look up, look around, um, remind myself of the, the time and date, remind myself that these are memories, these are mm -hmm. moments in the past. Um, and if I needed to close the laptop and come back to it another time. I mean, and those are tools that I had in place, you know, through years of living with this grief, years of, you know, therapy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I couldn't have written this book any sooner in my life. I think at another earlier time, I wouldn't have had those tools as at the ready. Um, or I might not have been as clear about what I could tell that would still be within my, you know, comfort zone. We all have our own line about sharing yeah. <laughs> what we want to yeah. make public. And, and I was really clear, mostly through the experiences of my music of like what, what I could tell and what I wanted to tell. Um, so I think this book, I mean, sometimes people ask me if it was, you know, uh, a cathartic experience and, I would say the catharsis happened before the book, like the catharsis happened certainly through music and sometimes even none of the music I performed or recorded, but just those moments at a piano of just sobbing and banging at the yeah. piano and yeah. those kind of, to me, catharsis is something that you, isn't necessarily what you would shape into art. It's like the, you're getting it out, you know, mm -hmm. and I've done cathartic writing, but it's not the stuff I would publish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so all of that like messiness had to happen beforehand. Mm. I think writing a book is a real, um, it's literally piecing things together to make it make sense. And when you're grieving, when you're struggling, you're falling apart, right? Mm -hmm. So those things don't really go together. I had to finish falling apart and be ready to piece it together. So I would say it was, there was sort of like, you know, a healing aspect. Um, but I was, I, I was ready to be careful in the writing. I was ready to pause when I needed to. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it was just checking in with myself. The long answer to your question was just doing my <laughs> best to be mindful as, as I went through it and like, is this okay? Am I okay? And if not, mm -hmm. what do I need to do? A huge part, I think, about that aspect about being mindful is exactly what you said. You couldn't have written this book any sooner, which I think is so important to share and to speak about because often when we are in the throes of grief, when we're in the throes of trauma, any experience that is intense and heightened and emotional, that is not the moment. Like you need to allow yourself the opportunity to, to process, to experience to move through it. And that's not to say you you won't continue to experience grief, you will, but that level of intensity may subside. So I'm so, I love what you said, like 
you couldn't have written this any sooner. It was about no. being mindful for yourself about your timing. And I think that's so important because we can feel rushed. We feel like we have to get to the next thing. We have to do this. We're in like a society that puts us on a bit of a hamster wheel. So I love what you said. You couldn't have written this any sooner. <laughs> There's a beautiful quote and I'm going to misquote it because I, I, mm. someone can look this up, but the idea that you, you create or you write from the scar, not from the wound. Like when you're oh. in it, it's too much, right? Yeah. yeah. So it still hurts. That scar still hurts, but it's not the like the, the kind of uncontained pain there's you have a mm -hmm. sense of the pain um mm -hmm. yeah I don't think I've heard that before but that that really beautiful you it's beautiful it. and we should look up share. who said it because yes I'm gonna mine. look it up when we're done and we'll, we'll credit me. we'll credit the right person <laughs> you know yeah. I want to talk about a little bit in the book you talk about your grief bio like the experiences that you've had and if anyone is brand new to you your music your work your book could we talk a little bit about um, your experiences and what, you know, what you share in the book and, and this grief bio, as you put it. Yeah. So the grief bio became a shorthand for those experiences, mm -hmm. which is, um, cancer, amputation, death, death, divorce, cancer. That was, that's also kind of my book outline. <laughs> I was you know, in my say, book, totally yeah, it's like, it's like chapter by chapter. Um, you know, when I, when I, thought about this book, when this book was kind of coming um, into shape in my mind, originally I was going to just write about um, the the deaths of my two sons. Those are the, mm -hmm. the two deaths in my, my grief bio, my son Emmett and my son Ford. And then it was in a conversation actually with my literary agent where she was like, you also have all these others kind of extraordinary experiences, these other losses. Yeah. And so I decided I wanted to write the book about loss, about the losses I've experienced. And loosely, each chapter focuses on a different loss. So that is having bone cancer when I was a kid, um, the amputation of my my left leg above the knee as the cure for that cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and I was very, very, very lucky to have that cure. Uh, and it was a loss. It was a huge change. Yeah. And then the death of my first son um, as a newborn, the death of my second son when he was 14 months old the end of my marriage after that. Um, and then I had a, a second kind of cancer. I had a thyroid cancer that put my music career on hold. And so, you know, when you make the list and we could probably all make our grief bio, mm -hmm. right? Like those mm -hmm. key points in your life where you're like, that, that was big, <laughs> Huge. <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, and so I started with that and then, you know, through the stories kind of connect a bit of what happened in between those major markers, you know, who I was before and after and how these shaped me but I know it's an extraordinary list and I in part wrote the book to kind of satisfy the curiosity about that list I think sometimes mm -hmm. people maybe they just know I'm like the person with one leg or maybe they know I'm the person who lost two children or and they wonder about it if they haven't had an experience in their own life or with someone in their life that that has something similar to it and so the book was kind of a way to like invite people into this grief mm -hmm. bio and uh and show people what it's been like for me well you said satisfy the curiosity around your grief bio and what people might know. It really struck me because often either when we've experienced grief and loss or something tragic or traumatic or someone in our life has, we don't know how to approach those people. And they often don't know how to approach us. What do we say? What do we not say? And I felt like your book was a beautiful invit invitation to show people like, this is a part of life and it's really uncomfortable and it's awkward and it's sad and it's scary, but it's enough for you just to show up and just to be there. And I think that's beautiful because we question ourselves like, do I ask about that experience somebody had? Do I not name it? Do I wait for them to name it? So your book does both things. It shares your personal experience, but then also invites the reader to think about those experiences in their lives and how they approach or, or be there for somebody else. And I, I just think we, we need more conversations like this. Yeah. I think, especially after last year, like it's okay to talk about the shitty stuff. Like it's okay to have those conversations. We don't have to skirt around it necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. And we're not skilled like in this culture, our North yes. American culture, we're not skilled in how to show up and how to manage that discomfort or mm -hmm. challenge that discomfort when it comes to these, you know, kind of quote unquote unpopular 
emotions. We have this, you know, good vibes only thing culturally, yeah. you know, that if you're having a hard time, it's like an imposition on someone else's good yeah. time. Like we're all yeah. supposed to be having a really good time. And of course that's not true. We're not all having no. a really good time. Most of the time we're not. No, no, no way. Most of the time we're not. Mm-hmm. Like shit happens that, you know, and, and life is beautiful and life is hard. Yeah. I, one feedback on the book that was, was really beautiful is that someone told me, gave them like an opportunity to practice witnessing um, something difficult, Mm. you know, and that because it's a book, they were able to feel awkward to reflect on what they were, you know, feeling as they read the book, um, and kind of practice being open to a hard story. And I thought Mm. that was really nice, because maybe we need to practice so that when it happens, and the person sitting across from us, (laughs) we're not, you know, like alienating our our close friend or our family. Yeah. Um, and it's hard. Like I, I also need that practice. I, I find okay. I will also jump to those. Oh, it's okay. You're going to be okay. Because of course we don't want people to suffer. We don't want the no. people that we care for to suffer. So, you know, it's ongoing work, but I think, I think we can all do it. I think we can mm. all learn how to be more welcoming of, of sorrow. Yeah. Practice witnessing. Like I can't get that out of my head. Because you're right, we jump to how can I fix this? How can I help you? Rather than just witnessing or being there in the moment for someone. So if someone is listening to this and they're like, okay, Sydney and Krista, this sounds great, but like, how do I like be there for someone in my life that's experiencing this level of grief and loss? It sounds like it probably starts with witnessing, but is there any advice um, that you can offer for anyone who is in that moment or is experiencing grief themselves, like how can I be there for someone? How can I support um, throughout those moments? Both when I think that it's ex- you're experiencing it, but then also beyond because that grief remains. Yeah, that's big. I mean, some of it I think depends on like your relationship to the person. I think if totally. there's in like early yeah. days where you're supporting someone in your life, in your community, who's going through some kind of loss. Um, that's big for them, you know, cause mm-hmm. it, it, if it's big for them and you want to show up the, I, I, there's ways that, you know, there's sort of like the casserole trope, but that's actually really, really helpful. But if you're not someone who cooks, like if you're like, mm-hmm. Oh, but I don't really know how to cook. I can't just bring them food. <laughs> what is the thing that's easy for you to do? And just do it. Like, are you a person who can make the spreadsheet so that other people are, you're organizing some friends to drop off food? Um, Are you the person who can just go and mow the lawn or the person who can just show up and do the laundry? Um, I know for me, I found in my sort of earliest days of grief around these losses, those supports are really, really big. And often those supports come with a kind of presence that is a witnessing. Like when someone drops off a meal, and they just sit with you for a minute or maybe they eat with you or they just put it in the fridge because you don't feel like eating and they're just kind of around. It was really nice just that there was someone sometimes around and I could talk if I wanted to talk. I didn't have to. And the sort of long term tip that I use and that I give to people is to remember these events. You know, if someone in your life has lost you know, a parent or a child or a partner put that date in your calendar, make it a yearly event, (laughs) maybe put a reminder a month beforehand in your calendar, a reminder on your phone so that you will check in and, and you will say, Hey, I know this anniversary is coming up. I'm just really thinking about you. Mm -hmm. I have found that incredibly powerful five years later, 10 years later, when people in my life have sent me a message saying, I know that this is, you know, Ford's birthday this week. I remember his curly hair. I remember Mm -hmm. his smile and I just am sending you so much love, you know, and it's, it, it makes the world of a difference to be remembered. We all want to be seen. We all want to be heard. And, you know, there can be a lot of attention and support around the event, Yeah, but it's the year later, the two years later, the five years later, when the shock has subsided, where other people might forget, which is fair, life is full, we all have stuff going on. But I have found that remembering one of the most supportive things. And it's something I try to do for other people too. That's my Mm. biggest tip. Mm. (laughs) I love both of those. Thank you for sharing because it just strikes me as showing up for others in moments of, of grief and loss the same way you would have shown up for them in life. So 
what are you good at? Do you like to cook? Are you a cleaner? Are you a helper? Are you an organizer? Sticking to what you know in those ways and then showing up. And I think I agree with you, the remembering, just knowing that someone remembers that loved one for you the same way that you do is, is, is we, I think we fear like, am I calling attention to the moment? No, it's actually huge. It makes a big difference if you remember alongside me. Yeah. I love that. I love yeah. that. You talked about this a little bit earlier, sort of the book was also, I think, a way for you to, to reflect on maybe shifts in your life and shifts in perspective from who you were, you know, pre, pre-cancer to post-cancer to pre-divorce to post-divorce. And I want to talk a little bit about maybe the shift in perspective you had um, throughout all of these moments of, and you said it like extraordinary grief, but we all experience grief and loss and have these shifts, I think, in perspective and maybe what is striking to us as important um, or, or a priority. So what was that like for you, shifting your perspective? Were you moving maybe from the space of grief to um, acceptance? Because I think it's a journey, but I'm curious and you do talk about it in the book, but I am curious like what this has been like for you, this sort of shift in perspective you've experienced maybe as a result of, of grief and loss. Yeah. The shift in perspective has been slow and hard. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like a turtle on a racetrack, just taking its time. Yep, mm-hmm. exactly. Mm-hmm. And, um, but of course, when we look back, we can see how, um, that our shoreline has changed. I was talking with someone recently, mm-hmm. actually uh, another podcast host, it's a podcast called um, Parenting Impossible. And she described her experience with grief as sort of like the the, the force of water changing your, your shoreline, you know? And mm-hmm. and I, I really like that metaphor. Um, and it's not until kind of after the fact that you can look back and go, oh, I, I see now mm-hmm. what, what remains. I mean, let me just think for one sec. For me, I think the biggest shift in perspective has been learning that, um, learning to let go of an idea of things getting better. Mm. Um, When I started to think about things being different was a real shift and a real moment of acceptance for me. And when I say moment, that again might've been like five, a five-year moment. (laughs) Um, But there was so much, both with you know losing my leg and having a disability, and with uh, the loss of my sons, where you know this life that I'm in now, it's not that it's it, this is not better <laughs> than mm-hmm. my life was with my sons or with yeah. my leg. It's different, mm-hmm. and there are beautiful, fulfilling, meaningful things in my life. I I have a daughter now who is a great source of of joy, and mm-hmm. my career and my partnership and like there's so much in my life that I love and is here now yeah and I wouldn't have sort of designed this life because those losses led me here and I don't say that in a like so it was all worth it it's just sort of my perspective has been coming to terms with like just looking at how those dots connected feeling compassion for them and Mm. knowing that this is different than what I thought it's Mm. not better it's not worse it's not maybe what I've hoped for, but I, I also can feel love and, and joy in this yeah. moment. Yeah. And I think for me too, a, a big part of that learning and acceptance was, oh, the grief won't go away, um, but other things will be introduced. And so mm-hmm. for a while there, and really this is when it comes to the losses of my sons, like they are the everything and how to lose everything really. Mm. Those uh, There's other losses that are, you know, that have impacted me, but really my sons are are the most present every day. And, um, for a while there, my life was, you know, 100% grief. And I, I felt that pain all the time, every waking moment. And over time, other things have been introduced. So it's not that the grief has gone away, (laughs) but Mm -hmm. now there's a mix and it just takes time for that to happen. It takes time for other things to be introduced and, and other joys to come in but it never replaces those losses. And I think that was a big part of the learning for me. This shift away from things will get better to things will be different. 
I really don't like the phrase things will be better and things will get better because I think in a lot of ways it's like it's unintentionally dismissing your experience in the moment. My experience right now is not that great. It could, it's not going to necessarily get better after it could, get worse. It could get worse. <laughs> we don't know, but yeah. it's about allowing yourself, I think, to find that level of acceptance in the moment and just knowing things will be different. It may not be better. It may not be worse. It may be the same, but finding that level of acceptance for yourself, I think is, I think is huge and something that we need when we're in the throes of loss and in the throes of grief. But you also described too about the shoreline shifting. I think that's such a beautiful meta metaphor or just visual because the truth is, is when you're in the throes of loss, um, and I have felt this over the last year, I lost my grandpa in October, 2020. Mm-hmm. And I mean, the, to lose someone in the middle of the pandemic was not so great. I don't mm-hmm. recommend. Um, but you feel like waves are hitting you. You know, it's this continual crashing and you're trying to sort of like fight against the waves and you're you're moving up against them and you're you're not making any traction because you're not moving with the current the moment you just kind of relax and surrender to this wave that is hitting you it's so much better like i don't know what else to say it's just so much better you don't feel as much resistance um or as if you're crashing up against yourself but then how you feel after has shifted that shoreline has changed how you approach a situation how you approach a moment a memory um an experience is different and i think knowing that every aspect of your life no matter what you're you're experiencing um whether it's grief loss sadness um frustration, disappointment, whatever, your perspective in that moment is going to shift. I think that's, oh, all right. Well, if you talk to that podcaster again, tell her, tell her how it's beautiful because <laughs> it's that really is good. so on point. That is so good. And that you're, I mean, you are still here. You are mm. this, you are this land, you are this place in the world, yeah, yeah. but your shape has changed. Right. And so it changes yeah. you, um, which I think is what's beautiful about it too. And yeah, there was for me that, that um, it's, it's such a funny kind of um, uh, contradiction because Mm -hmm. the minute that we accept, okay, this is hard or this is shit, or I'm really struggling here. Yeah. And, and the minute people around us go, yeah, yeah, this is hard instead of like, oh, oh, it's going to be okay. The minute that we give it that acceptance, we do actually feel a bit better. Like, we do. Because yeah. if you're not fighting it, like there's so this sort of like suffering, you're suffering. Like if you're already mm-hmm. having a hard time, don't add these expectations and other stuff on top that just makes it worse. And so the minute you can say like, okay, this is what's happening. You know, I'm in despair or this is, I hate this or whatever. Once we have that acceptance, it actually is, you know, there's a bit more of ease with it or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a really interesting sort of contradiction. I'm really sorry for your loss. Oh, thank you. Grandpa. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I appreciate that. You know, it's interesting as you were speaking, I felt like part of acceptance is like, we kind of learn to accommodate ourselves to grief too. Like it just becomes part of your life and learning how to accommodate yourself to grief. I feel like also means knowing and recognizing your boundaries around it. And as I was thinking about that, I I was brought back to something you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, when you were talking about writing the book, it was like, you knew what you were going to include and you knew what you weren't going to include in the book. And you knew you couldn't have written this book any sooner. You needed to allow yourself to write from the scar as opposed to the wound. I think this piece about boundaries around grief is huge because I don't know how to explain it. You just don't know what they are until you experience it. And then it's a process of trial and error. Like how much do I share? How much do I keep to myself? Um, How much do I allow myself to experience in the moment? How much do I like put on the shelf for later? What was your experience like with that level of maybe boundaries or, or even that aspect of accommodating yourself to grief a little bit? Yeah. So the two parts to that, I mean, the accommodation thing is really interesting. I have sometimes made the correlation or the comparison between disability and grief as something that I need to plan for in my day. Mm. I mean, there's, you know, uh, for particularly in in like neurodivergent community, like the concept of spoons, like how many spoons do you have in a day? What can you manage in a day? And, and I feel like with grief, 
um, you know, or disability for me, I have one leg and I, I, I need to kind of think about my day, like which places am I going? How much walking is that? Are there stairs? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I choose to go to this place, I won't do this other thing later, or I need to decide I'm going to need about a half hour to rest after like there's that planning. And when it comes to grief, I discovered there's the same kind of planning mm -hmm. <laughs> and the same kind of like, okay, I'm going to go to this party. Here's my exit strategy. If I end up triggered or overwhelmed, you know, or like, here's what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to, you know, only go for an hour because that's all I can take or or just you need to kind of think about your capacity in a mm -hmm. similar way and make accommodations and, and adjust for what those needs are. And you're right. It's a trial and error. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and as far as boundaries, also trial and error. I mm -hmm. think when it came to, you know, I'm sharing this stuff publicly, you know, I've published it in a book. I've, yeah. I've you know, put these stories in music for over years as well. Um, and it was really through the experience of, of releasing um, my kind of four full length albums, each of which had some of these stories on them. And there was, you know, the press release of the publicity stuff. And with each of those albums, I was going through that process of deciding what to say. And in the beginning, because I was new to it and because I was younger, mm -hmm. I found that there was more in there than I wanted to share. And I was getting questions from media and stuff that were were too much for me. And so I learned this balance of like, okay, well, how much do I want to make available in the first place? Yeah. And how do I manage those questions if they're pushing at something I don't want to get into? And it just, it took time for that skill mm -hmm. to develop as far as someone who's doing something publicly. Um, and so that's what I mean when it came to the book. I was like, okay, journalist, I know what you're going to ask. I'm ready for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm prepared this time. So I've got, I've got my boundaries. I know what I'm willing to talk about. I know what is too much for me. I, what you just said reminds me about, there's this part in your book where you talk about this conversation you had with your therapist that like resilience sucks. Like we, like, I was thinking so much when I read that part of the book, I was like, yeah, it does suck because it's born out of like difficult situations, difficult like moments in life where you are tested, where you have this opportunity for lack of a better word to like really understand like, what can I handle? What is too much? How do I like expand my bandwidth in that way? Um, we in society, I think we like make resilience look like this really great thing. Like, oh, she's so resilient. Um, I'm sorry. I would kind of like rather not be the most <laughs> resilient, but I, there's, I would love to talk about this a little bit in, in that conversation you had, because I think we often glorify resilience, but really it's coming from these like really difficult moments in our lives. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I have so many thoughts about this. <laughs> Please. I'm excited. <laughs> Cause when I read that, I was like, yes, yes, like finally somebody is saying it. It's not that great guys. Like but it's, it's also great, great at the same time, but it's like this double-edged sword sort of. Exactly. I mean, I I am a resilient person. Yeah. Um, my resilience has been revealed through these really devastating experiences. And your own resilience will only be revealed mm -hmm. when something brutal happens. Yes. So, you know, it exactly it's not something you can be like, oh, I'm so glad I know this about myself. At the same time, I'm I'm glad that I've been able to kind of carry through these hard times. That said, I think there's another way, you know, like you said, we glorify resilience, that we're putting a pressure on the individual that mm -hmm. is unfair. Because mm -hmm. sometimes people look at me and they kind of lift me up like, oh, you're so incredible. You're so strong. And I, I, I don't mean to diminish, you know, my own spirit, but at the same time, there are things in place, you know, due to my like social location um, that are actually what made my, you know, quote unquote, survival possible in that I mm -hmm. have always been housed and fed and I had access to therapy and that yeah. has been a lifesaver. I've had resources that not everyone has. And so to lift me up as sort of a remarkable, you know, resilient person and look at someone else and go, oh, they're not so resilient. Mm -hmm. They might not have the same resources. Yeah. So we need to help them. It is not on the individual to um, survive everything. We need to, as communities, care for each other and support each other. And it's also okay to not be resilient. Mm -hmm. It's okay to say, I can't handle this. This is too hard. And I think when we sort of glorify resilience, we're potentially making it harder for someone to say, 
it's too much, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I think that last point is, is the biggest takeaway for me is like, it's okay if you can't handle things. It's okay if you don't feel resilient in this moment, or you just don't have that level of tolerance for what it is that you are experiencing or what is hitting you. If you are experiencing this huge sense of overwhelm and disease and everything in the moment, it's okay. And I think the more that we normalize that, the more that we speak that into existence, it's going to do exactly what you, what you mentioned is open up the door. I think for people to be okay, to express like, Hey, I'm not okay. Hey, I can't handle this because the more that we champion resilience and we champion like, Oh, you can handle it. You've done this before. You've done that before. I, I personally wouldn't feel so good about saying like, actually, no, I can't handle this. This is actually too much for me. So it's, I think about opening that door for that level of vulnerability and honesty and truth telling about your experience without like the level of shame or guilt or pressure that I think often accompanies that level of resilience or like, I can handle this. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Something I wanted to ask you about too, is this element of, you know, grief doesn't necessarily exist in isolation. When you are experiencing loss, it's not the only emotion you experience. I'm thinking back to the last eight months or so. And, um, you know, you have these moments of like profound sadness and, and grief. And then in the next moment you remember something and you're so happy and you're laughing. And I think it's a testament to how we have this capacity to experience both grief and joy, you know, at the same time. So I'm curious what your experience has been like throughout your grief journey, throughout your life, experiencing also, or allowing yourself to experience this element of joy, um, alongside your grief? Because I don't think it's something we often talk about. We talk about like the hard and difficult emotions, but we don't talk about the joy, the levity, the celebration, the hope that I think comes with it too. Yeah. It's interesting. I think what I've heard from a lot of other people, and I felt this too, was like, particularly in the beginning after a loss that you'll you know, maybe it's a week later, a month later, and yet you laugh at something and then mm-hmm. you feel kind of guilty. Mm, that <laughs> like guilt that comes with it. I shouldn't be laughing. Like I, you know, there, there's, I'm supposed to behave in some certain way right now. And if I'm laughing, then I must not be sad anymore. And it's just, I, I don't know why we have these, you know, narrow ideas because we can feel all of those things at once. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we yes, can we can. Heartbroken and devastated and cracking jokes. Yeah. Um, and we need a break too. There's also ways of finding joy and levity because you just need, need uh, some reprieve, you know, um, there can, that can be part of coping. Um, I don't know if my mic's picking up the bird song. <laughs> my window's open because of the It's heat beautiful. <laughs> okay. I love it. It's a beautiful okay. company, like a um, companion to what you're saying. I was like, Oh, that will sing so good. Right on cue little bird. I birds. really so, like, like it. I, I just want to love about post. podcasting too is like you just pick up the real moments like yeah. the birds chirping like I had a door slam like 10 minutes ago like it's just life it's my just daughter life. might have been yelling about her lunch I'm not sure if you heard that <laughs> you didn't hear that one <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I mean so I've definitely experienced bumping into that I should be feeling yeah. this I yeah. shouldn't be feeling that there is no right or wrong way to grieve we are complex people who can feel all kinds of things at mm-hmm. the same time, mm-hmm. even if it's just to distract yourself, that's a okay too, you know, um, at the same time, it can, when you're in it feel surprising. Like I yeah. think there's a scene in the book that was shortly after my, my son Ford died and my, my ex-husband and I were at a beach and we were splashing in the water and we were laughing and, and our friend who was with us was like, I was just watching you enjoying yourself and thinking, you know, here's everyone around you and they have no idea that, you know, in many ways your world has just ended. And, mm-hmm. and here's this moment kind of of levity and enjoying the the water and the sun. And, and, um, and she knew looking at us, what else was going on, um, but no one else did. I mean, it's, it's a fascinating part of like our human existence that so mm-hmm. much can happen at once. Mm-hmm. Grief is both visible, but also invisible. 
Yeah. And the truth is, is when we are walking down the street or living our lives, you really don't know what somebody else is experiencing or not experiencing. And so to allow yourself to share that, that part of your life that I think is invisible to many. So unless you're really in someone's inner circle or they're sharing it publicly, you, you don't know. So for you to make that shift into sharing this aspect of your life and making it very visible it reminds me of something you talk about in the book too. And this is the first element of your grief bio with bone cancer and losing your leg. I know that you have this like prosthetic leg. It's beautiful. It's like covered in flowers. And when you talk about it in the book, you talk about how it's like this opportunity for you to make your disability visible in a way that was approachable for other people. And I feel like that's also what you've done with grief in general is you've made it approachable for people. You've allowed people to witness it. But I'm curious, like when you made that shift to wearing this beautiful prosthetic leg and uh, we'll put it on our Instagram as part of like when we share this episode, like photos of you and it's just so beautiful. What was that experience like? Like were, did people shift how they approached you? Like how did you feel personally too? making an element of yourself that I think we often hide. Like we, people, we want to hide our disability. We want to hide things that um, make us different, quote unquote, from the rest of the world. What was that shift like for you into this element of visibility that I think was probably really profound in the moment? Yeah. Yeah. We all want to hide the thing that we feel is exactly quote unquote different or yeah. you know not acceptable and we feel that way because we're fed all kinds of garbage yes we are <laughs> about you know what a body is supposed to be and which yes. is this very narrow you know some people have that thin white tall cisgender yes. body some people do sure so many of us don't right no. No. and so we're all dealing with that information <laughs> Um, from a very and, young age, <laughs> from a very young age. Yeah. Yes. And disability is, is a big one, right? Like, yeah. um, and it came to, yeah, making it not only visible, but like pointing a neon sign to the yeah. fact that I wear a prosthetic leg, it had an impact that I, I didn't even anticipate. Mm -hmm. You know, I, at the time wanted to, I wanted to celebrate that I had um, got this new kind of leg that my friends and family and community had crowdfunded for me. It's this microprocessor knee oh, wow. that is not covered by our, our healthcare here. And, um, and it's $40,000 knee that people fundraised for me to have. It was an incredible event. Mm. I felt so lifted and loved. And so I sort of wanted to honor that I had been given this thing by everyone around me. And so I decided to get the, yeah, the flower leg, this, yeah. this, this floral finish and to be super out <laughs> about mm. my disability. And I thought that I was just going to kind of, I was kind of challenging myself on like, okay, this is, I don't need to hide this. This mm -hmm. is my body. You know, there's some things about this that are cool. It's different. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, I can feel confident in my body, inclusive of my disability, not in spite of it. And so I was doing that for myself, but then what happened was this incredible and it's ongoing. I've had the flower leg, you know, for seven years, I still mm. get this feedback where people, you know, come up to me and, and, and they're just saying, you know, is it okay? Can I ask you about it? Like, how did it get made? And is it hand painted wow. and how does it work? And there's this curiosity and no one is saying, oh, you only have one leg. I'm so sorry. Or like, what happened to you? Which is like never okay to ask a stranger. No. I mean, really you should never ask a stranger about their body period, but hard to <laughs> no, I never. don't mind the questions about my leg. And many people are like, I don't know if I can say something. Can I say something? Um, you know, and then I say, absolutely. I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah. Um, but of course, in getting that feedback, that, you know, solidified feeling good about myself, because we all want, need that feedback. I mean, we're all combating this negative feedback about bodies. And so for people to like come up to me every day and go, oh my God, that's amazing, um, <laughs> was really great. And I hope might even introduce for them some different ideas about disability. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that doesn't have to be hidden. It's something we can feel good about. Not every day. It's not like every day I'm like, woohoo, I'm disabled. But uh, most of the time I don't mind. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. And there's things about the experience that I am I'm grateful for. So 
um, yeah, it really shifted how I talk about my disability and unexpectedly absolutely changed how people talk to me about it. Mm. I'm really struck by what you said that we don't need to hide, like you don't need to hide. And I think whether it's grief, whether it's, um, something that makes you quote unquote different, whether it's a disability, whether it's anything, the message is you don't need to hide. And the more that we make ourselves visible, the more we encourage others to, to be, to be visible in that way as well. And I'm just like, so struck by this whole conversation and so grateful that we were able to sit down together because what I really am taking from this is that grief has really transformed you. Like it really has, like from your perspective to how you treat yourself, to how you speak to yourself, to what you choose to share, to um, this element of inviting others in to your own personal experience. And so I have just two questions I want to ask you to close. The first one is, it goes back to this element of transformation. What do you think younger Krista would think about where you are right now or what you're sharing, what would your younger self think, think about all of this? Oh, she would not believe it. You know, (laughs) (laughs) she'd be like, who, what, where, what's going on? (laughs) Yeah. Especially around the love and acceptance I have Mm. for my disabled body. You know, my leg was amputated when I was 13 and adolescence is a battlefield, right? Yes, like, it, is. Yeah. it is a tough time. And um, and so it felt like this kind of exaggerated, like our bodies are changing at that age. We're becoming self-conscious. We're starting to compare ourselves in new ways. And I had this huge change. Um, and so I think younger me at that time would not believe that I feel good <laughs> um, in this body. Um, and I think as far as uh, the other losses, I mean, a younger me in my teens, I mean, motherhood wasn't even on my radar. And yeah. so I think even having children younger me would be like, what? There's babies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it just would all be so unexpected. Although I would want to tell that younger version, like you're going to like, it looks scary, but you're going to get through. Hmm. It looks scary, but you're going to be okay. You'll get yeah. through it. And, uh, Things will look different, but you'll be okay. Yeah. All right. My last question for you. um, And this is really the question I ask everybody that comes on the podcast, but as we look to the future, so we were just looking at the past, but as we look to the future, um, what is your biggest dream? Hmm. What is my (laughs) biggest dream? Oh, it's interesting. You know, we've talked about hope and I'm so careful to hope in a way mm-hmm. because it can, like, you know, be sort of named, it can sort of feel like it dismisses our reality sometimes. Yeah. yeah. At the same time, that idea of unknowing uh, what, what will come is a kind of hope for me. Mm-hmm. And so my, my biggest dream is, is to continue, <laughs> is to continue to make work and make art is to continue to be with my daughter and watch her life unfurl Mm. and it's to continue to do my best to (sighs) settle (laughs) Mm -hmm. I don't mean settle you know settle like accept that I mean like be grounded (laughs) my biggest dream is to just continue to like feel my earth on the ground my earth on the ground feel my feet on the ground and uh and, and be open to mystery. That's all I can ask for. Mm, Because being open to mystery means being open to the unknown, being open to how this life moves, ebbs, flows, the path that opens, the path that closes. This is beautiful. Thank you so much for this conversation. I am so excited to share this one. So could we share with everyone where they can find you, connect, learn more, and get your beautiful book, which I'm about to hold up for everybody on YouTube. It's really beautiful. It's called How to Lose Everything. And is this, this is the print, the floral print that's on your leg, right? <laughs> that's right. The I designer surprised me with, um, uh, she ordered the fabric that I used to cover oh my, my leg God. and took a photograph of it. Yeah. So it's, it feels like it's a photo of me on the book. <laughs> I mean, talk but- about just incorporating that real personal element of visibility. Yeah, absolutely. Mm, Beautiful. Um, So the book is available 
wherever you get your books, your local independent bookstore, your Amazon, your library, it's out there. It's coming out on paperback in September. So um, that will be available soon as well. It's on hardcover now. And I'm online, KristaCouture.com and on Twitter and Facebook. I'm most active on Instagram, which is Mm -hmm. at Krista Couture. Perfect. All right. So everything will go in the show notes. We'll make it so easy for everyone to connect with you and learn more. And Krista, thank you for this conversation, I think, on grief and loss, but the transformation that comes with it and just how powerful it is to, I think, allow yourself to experience your emotions, the highs and lows, the depths, but then also to not be afraid to share it. Because I think there's a huge gift that comes in the sharing, in the welcoming, in your own expression, but then also allowing others to be part of this journey with you. So thank you so much again. Thank you. Seek the Joy podcast is a production of Seek the Joy Media and created, produced, and hosted by me, Sydney Weiss. You can tune into all of our episodes on your favorite podcast platform. And if you're enjoying the show, hit follow and leave us a five-star rating and review. Make sure to join the community, join the conversation on our social media channels, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. We are at Seek the Joy Podcast everywhere. And don't forget, you can actually watch today's new episode and all of our episodes on our brand new YouTube channel. Click that link in the show notes to subscribe and tune in. As always, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. And I'll see you right back here next week for another Seek the Joy Tuesday.